Welcome to Behind the Scenes. I am your host, Hector Montalvo. This show is dedicated to asking tough questions for you, the viewers. We bring you their responses, and we let you decide. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the civil court system. Massachusetts is one of seven states who appoint judges until the age of 70 years old to sit on the bench. This method is used to appoint lawyers who contribute to campaigns. Lawyers are appointed based on who they know and how much they have contributed rather than what they know about the law. Once appointed a judge in Massachusetts, you become a judge for life. And the best perk of the job is there is no accountability for you as a judge. Right now, the only way to remove a judge is to a public bill of address, which is rarely used in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In order for a public bill of address to be filed to remove a judge, your state representatives must file the bill on your behalf. What you may find is that these representatives will, sub will never submit a bill that removes a judge because of fear. Filing a public bill of address requires the name of your representative submitting your request, which 99.9% .9 of them will never submit your request and they will work behind closed doors to kill that bill in committee. Another way to hold judges accountable in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is by filing a complaint with the CJC the Commission of Judicial Misconduct. When you file a complaint with them, that complaint is made available to the judge and you are ordered to keep the complaint confidential. Joining us here today via Zoom from her home in Miami, Florida, please welcome Ms. Pilar Matei. Ms. Pilar, welcome to the show. Thank you, Hector. Thank you for having me here on your show. After so many years in contact, because we started this virtual friendship about three years ago, when I reached out to you in a scream for help, and you were there for me, and today we see each other on camera. So thank you so much for having me for the, here. For the first time, we see each other on <laughs> camera. I'm glad to have you on the show. Pilar, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and, you, and what you have done to start a movement? Uh, Pilar Mate is a mother. I was born and raised in Spain. I arrived to the United States in 1993. I was illegal in the United States for nine years. It was really hard for me um, to be able to have a decent life, a decent job, and I'm a really hard worker. Uh, I'm a woman who doesn't take uh, a no for an answer. And um, I had a, a daughter uh, in 2009 uh, with um, a person that um, we, we don't seem to share the same ideas or values of what is best for our daughter. And um, sometime in 2017, I lost custody of my daughter, um, my oldest daughter, um, because the father was... Um, chasing me in a parking lot while videotaping. Um, he used so to you, let, let me stop you right there. You, so you said that you lost custody of your daughter because of your husband or ex-husband chasing you. How does that, I mean, if somebody is chasing you, doesn't that make you a victim? Not necessarily. Uh, well, first of all, we were never married. So he was the father of my daughter. He was videotaping me in a parking lot. The police in Weymouth, Massachusetts, did a, a lousy job. Uh, we, when they arrived to the scene, they never took um, fingerprints. Uh, they never took photos of the scratches that he self-inflicted. They never took pictures of the phone or even uh, took pictures of the videos that he was um, capturing when he was harassing me and my family. The only thing they, they did is that uh, they saw the very basics, like a, like a high level picture of, you know, there is a, a man that is 
uh, uh, batter because he self-inflicted wounds and he, they saw a phone that is broken and they saw a woman, which is, was me, that I was hysterical because I was really nervous and I'm a Spanish. So my, my level of stress was up to the roof. Um, and they decided to harass, arrest me for a few hours and, um, and charge me with assault and battery. Uh, he used this incident to take uh, temporary custody uh, of my daughter from me and it was really um, uh, curious because months after this, in the criminal trial, he asserted the Fifth Amendment right. The Fifth Amendment uh, right means that you the are- The right to remain silent. You, you were committing a crime and you rather uh, remain silent. However, sadly, I had already lost custody of my daughter, Sophia. So- he pleaded the fifth or you pleaded the fifth no, he, he pleaded the fifth he he, he had a, a lawyer appointed at the court uh the lawyer reviewed the entire um incident and they probably advised him you probably should plead the fifth because what you were doing chasing this woman and her family while videotaping against their will was a crime, so you need to remain quiet. So he pleaded the fifth, and then all my charges were um, dismissed. However, I had already lost custody of my child, and I was placed on a two hour supervised visit. This was in 2017, and then I had a change in judges, which is really unfortunate. I had Randy Kaplan in Essex, uh, who I want to think that she was really fair um, and, and well, you know, well put together uh, judge um, mentally wise. And she got retired and they transferred my case to Judge Averroes on November 2017. And that was the, the catalyst or the detrimental point of my case because, um, you know, Abel Ross, we we will talk and discuss the 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 countless problems that are with this judge and um, and her biased behavior and how she uh, does not want to do the hard work of a judge despite her salary. I found her I found her salary this week, um, and it's amazing that for a hundred and eighty four thousand dollars, she decides to take the easy way out and not read the pleadings and the dockets um, in a file. Um, so Now, when you say taking the easy way out um, and not reading your your docket and, and so on, how, how do you know that this is happening with that particular judge? I'm not the only one. I mean, uh, so what happened is that I went to a trial in 2019. I remain on supervised visits for up to two hours a week from 2017, from October 2017 uh, until uh, the trial, which was in February 2019. And let's keep in mind that supervised visits are um, expensive. It's about 50 to $70 per hour every time you want to see your child with a supervised visit. So every time, every week I had to pay about $150 to see my child supervised for two hours. And I couldn't even talk about important, substantial things. I had to talk about, you know, the weather, how's the school, um, how are your feelings, you know, how are your friends? I couldn't deep down in a conversation, mother, daughter, because everything was being documented. So um, I had to keep it very superficial. So when I went to um, trial in 2019, I had a four day trial. Uh, I had a bunch of um, uh, witnesses testifying on my behalf. And I also incorporated a bunch of physical evidence, such as documentation. And one of the documentations that I incorporated in my trial was the, uh, the testimony of my child through DCF, the Department of Children's and Families, where she clearly explained uh, the, the pains that she was experiencing with her father, who was forcing her to videotape her on a, on a weekly basis, 
forcing her to say things about her mother and then using those videos in the core uh, for litigation purposes. My daughter was exhausted. She was experiencing suicidal ideations. And she described to DCF what truly happened on that um, August 11, 2017, and how her father chased her in a parking lot while he was laughing and having a blast about the entire situation and how traumatizing it was. And Judge Ross decided to not incorporate the testimony, not only my testimony, but the testimony of Sophia, my daughter, and the testimony of the GAL, the pediatrician, the therapist, um, the psychiatrist evaluation. So sometime in May, uh, I think it was May 14th, I received uh, a judgment and it was appalling. It was appalling and, and, and funny to see 218 clauses written describing me as human garbage. Like, I should not even be allowed to be a mother. 218 clauses accusing me of absolutely everything, describing me as a bad mother, bad person, um, and zero about father. And uh, let, statistically let me, wise, it's impossible. Let me ask you, so you say you lost custody of your child and you were also being they were charging you to visit with your child. Is that correct? Did I hear you say that right? Correct. I was placed in supervised visits. And every time you have a supervised visit with a therapeutic supervisor or any supervisor, you have to pay. So I had to pay for already three years and a half to see my child for up to two hours a week. And that was that that order came from the uh, civil side of the court, the family and probate court, or did that come based on your arrest, your prior arrest? No, to... it came from Essex because father used the arrest as an excuse to say mother is unstable, she was arrested. And so the judge Kaplan, I understand, she has to make a decision and say, oh, maybe this woman is unfit as a mother, she's mentally Have... unstable. But Did then, you have a, trial a few months after that, it? we have a father a pleading the fifth where he says, wait, I was doing something that I was not supposed to do. And instead of reversing and saying, well, we need to return this child to the mother because the father was doing something that was criminal, it was kept in a status quo, and then it was scheduled for a trial in 2019. So let me ask you, so... If, if the judge was doing this to you and acting uh, under the color of law and against protecting your, your rights as a parent, you've never been found guilty in a court of law that uh, they have been able to prove to you that you are an unfit parent and you are a danger to being with your children before they even take in custody? Correct. Without a trial. Well, in the criminal trial, I was, all my charges were dismissed. When we arrived to the, crim, to the custody trial, what father alleged was that um, all the things that my, my daughter was claiming were because I was coaching my daughter. However, the GAL, for those who are not familiar with the terminology, the guardian at Lightem, who is the person who does a 350, a 360, I'm sorry, um, investigation on the family collateral, so and so, uh, the guardian at Lightem said, This child is not coached. This child certainly does not want to live with father. This child is in distress every single weekend, wants to live with mother, and is happy with mother and little sister Violetta and her stepdad. And that was submitted, and that was submitted as evidence uh, in your case to the to the current judge that you have, Judge Ross. Uh, it was submitted to Ross as a testimony. My GAL was there, and then it was funny, um, Walter, because I had a pediatrician who testified in my trial and said, "Mr. Borges is absolutely crazy." This man has called our pediatric office making verbal threats to the entire staff 
is that as a result of that, we had to terminate the care for Sophia. So this is what parental alienation does. When somebody wants to control you and manipulate you, they make sure that you lose contact with everything that surrounds you that can provide support to you. So my daughter lost her mother. My daughter lost her therapist because he took her to another therapist. My daughter lost her pediatrician, a female pediatrician who took care of her from the age of two years old. So the pediatrician testified and said, this man is absolutely insane. He calls our office making verbal threats and we are afraid so we can no longer allow him to come in our premises. So if he has custody of Sophia, he cannot come into our building. Hence, they terminated care for Sophia. So little by little, he started cutting all the network around her to isolate her so she could not communicate with the people that were able to help her. So if the judge had violated all those rules of the court and, and, and you felt that they violated your rights, what steps did you take to try to hold that particular judge accountable? I received the judgment uh, from May 14th and I was, I was in absolute shock. I have to say that I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to kill myself. I wanted to die. I couldn't believe 218 clauses accusing me of everything and striping me from every single right. I, I was placed on supervised visits. Unusual. I mean, if even if I am a drug addict or if I consume alcohol on an excessive level or if I am a prostitute or, you know, if I have any mental disorder, the normal path will be, let's put this mother on a recovery plan of six months, five months, and let's see how she's doing in a few months. And then let's reevaluate the situation again. But Judge Ross decided to put me on supervised visits for the rest of my life. So when I recover emotionally from the news, I said, there has to be more people like me. So I started to look for other victims of Averroes. And to my surprise, I was not the only one. There were many others. And I was just going to ask you that. You started a group to remove Judge Ross. And I believe that there is a public bill of address currently uh, circulating at the, at the State House to remove her. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so sometime in June 2019, after I was mentally able to cope with this and I went back to work, um, I started to look for victims. It was funny because I, as I say in other interviews, I really don't know how I didn't lose my jobs because I was spending the entire day looking for victims of Abba Ross. I was able to find a website in Massachusetts where you can see all the appeals that are um, in the uh, appeals court uh, against a particular judge because you can filter by judge. And I noticed that there were multiple um, appeals against Abel Ross. I filed my, my own appeal and I was able to find the victims and then you can see who is the appellant and who is the respondent, meaning who has been a victim and who has been favored by Abba Ross. Um, so sometimes it was very hard for me to find the person because it was a really common name, like, you know, John Smith or Mary, uh, you know, Mary White. But um, I was able to start looking for victims like Walter Sorensen. And uh, I started to gather people and I contacted them and I said, look, uh, I may sound like a crazy person, but my name is Maria Pilar and I am a victim of Abba Ross. I believe you have a similar case. I believe you are a victim. I want to contact you and connect with you. And I want to learn about your case and I want to join forces. And if, if we become strong and if we have a good and solid voice and if we are coherent and a well put together group, we may be able to bring these 
up to the attention of the authorities and the government in Massachusetts and explain to them that a person as Abe Ross should not be having a job as a judge because she's unable to remain unbiased. So uh, why did you ever file any complaints with this uh, CJC, which is the, the department that is responsible for investigating judges? Yes, I did. I did at the very beginning. I filed uh, four complaints and the four of them were dismissed. I continue filing more and they were dismissed until um, this past month of February where I, so it was really funny because I sent uh, a complaint, I filed a complaint on October 19th 2020 with the Commission of Judicial Conduct. I sent a, a letter to Howard Neff, who is the head of the commission. And I and I rewrote all my complaints. I didn't give up. I wrote exactly the same what happened to me. And 10 days after that, he comes back to me with a letter saying, sorry, we didn't find any misconduct. And this case is closed. So in the month of February, I sent Howard Neff and the Commission of Judicial Conduct an analysis that I did on my entire judgment with over a hundred pages, an analysis that took me three months to do, going, finding a fact by finding a fact with the exact place where you can find the evidence that Jack Ross lied and terhiversated the witness testimony to accommodate to what she wanted to say in her findings of facts and her judgment. And I say to the commission, if it took me three months to do this work, it is impossible that it took you 10 days to tell me that you didn't find any misconduct. So please go back and do your job. Certainly, a few days after that, I received a letter from the commission saying that Abel Ross was under investigation. And that is correct. I mean, we do understand that she is being investigated right now. We understand that she is being uh, supervised on all her uh, hearings from the first justice of the court as well. Yeah. So we do understand that. Now, the uh, Justice uh, Judge Ross, there was also uh, a billboard that you guys um, put up flashing it where dozens of people were seeing that driving by the highway, mm -hmm. um, removing uh, Judge Ross. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we decided to put a billboard on the route that uh, many people take to go to the Salem court. It was, uh, well, we, by, by legal reasons, the billboard company was not allowed to put Abba Ross's name, like victims of Abba Ross or any reference to Abba Ross because they could be liable. So we decided to put a bill, I mean, to, sorry, to put a, a sign that says Massachusetts law reform, contact us at such and such. Because what we think the victims is that this has made so much, such an amount of noise. We have been in so many newspapers, Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly. I have been interviewed by Univision two times. I've been on TV. Um, there, there has been such an amount of noise that this is probably going to lead to a judicial reform in the probate courts of Massachusetts. I know that, that uh, John Casey, who is the head, of Massachusetts probate courts is exhausted of reading emails of complaints. And probably somebody above him is gonna start tapping him in the shoulder and say, look, this is starting to be way too much noise. We don't want this kind of publicity and we need to fix this. And this is what I told my group when I started two, three years ago. And I say, the minute that media pay attention to us, and we are on the news, and it's when, it's when we are going to become an embarrassment for government. And it's, it's not necessarily that they want to fix the issue of corruption in the courts of Massachusetts, but it's because we are making such an amount of noise that is embarrassing for Charlie Baker. And the family, the family court system is supposed to be protecting children, 
and looking out for the children's best interest. I understand that in the public bill of address, there were a total of 62 attorneys that sent in a letter of support, supporting the judge. Do you know anything about that? Yes. Um, one of the articles that came out was uh, published in a very well-known um, uh, newspaper online and print newspaper called Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly. Um, this is a publication where about 7,000 attorneys and lawyers are subscribed in Massachusetts. Uh, pretty much any attorney reads this uh, publication. And we were able to obtain um, uh, an article, thank you to Chris Olson, mentioning the bill of address. And immediately within two or three days, Amy Hubbard, who is an attorney and intimate, intimate friend of Ava Ross, decided to start gathering signatures um, in support of her friend, um, Ava Ross, which is a violation of the code of ethics because many of these 62 attorneys were representing victims that were victims of Ava Ross. And these victims were paying money to these 62 attorneys. And then these 62 attorneys were helping Ava Ross to stay on her bench. We don't know if there is a money trail, but certainly it is completely unethical. So to my understanding, 62 complaints have been filed with the BBO, which is the board of bar, you know, the, the board that oversees the attorneys in Massachusetts. So it was a really big mistake for them to get involved in that. Um, if I was an attorney and somebody approaches me and says, you know, we want to get your signature to support Abba Ross because she's going to be removed from the bench. And I am an ethical attorney. I would say, I don't want to get involved. My obligation is to protect my clients, not the judges. Well, let me just let you know that in the state of Massachusetts, attorneys take an oath to the court and the court is their primary client. Unfortunately. Yes. Okay. Ms. Pillard, the group that you founded, how can people look you up? And if there's other victims of Judge Ross um, that want to reach out to you and, and get your help and everything that you have been doing for the movement to remove this judge uh, for, for reasons that, you know, only you know, um, how do they look you up and how do they reach out to you? Well, the first thing I want to say is that, uh, thank God, I, I no longer have Abel Ross as a judge. I made such an enormous amount of noise that uh, John Casey has transferred my case to a different judge in a different court. They don't even want me in Essex anymore because I make way too much noise. Uh, so uh, I no longer have Abel Ross as a problem but I am still supporting this cause. And if people want to contact the group or are a victim of other Ross, I want them to know that we are going to have a hearing at some point with the committee that is overseeing this bill of address or, 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 or como, like we say in Spanish, is the proyecto de ley. Um, and they can send an email to either uh, state representative Lenny Mira, who is the state representative has who has docketed the bill or they can send an email to victims of abbe ross at gmail.com uh, they can contact you and i'm sure that you know how to put them in contact with me but i want everybody to know that if they have been a victim of this judge um that they have a voice um the committee will be um, happy to give them a few minutes to speak at the hearing and, and that we're just hoping to have some justice and some children return back to their houses. Well, we wish you the best of luck in your fight and in your battle to remove the judge and, and with you. your, uh, your child as well. We want to thank you for appearing on the show and giving us a little insight as to the dealings that you've dealt with in the uh, family court system. Thank you. Uh, there is a lot of work to be done. 
I want to say thank you to you, Hector, because about three and a half years ago, somebody said to me, you need to contact Hector Montalvo. He has a show on TV behind the scenes, and he's an amazing advocate for people who are victims of the judicial system, political system, uh, government, law enforcement. And that's how you and me, we connected. And I have to say that you are doing an amazing job. So thank you so much for making me part of your job. Of your, well, your we want to. We want to thank you for that, and uh, thank you for appearing on the show. Absolutely. You, you've been watching Behind the Scenes. I'm your host, Hector Montalvo. Join us next time as we go behind the scenes to ask some tough questions, bring you their responses, and we let you decide. Thank you for watching.